National News has shown a Georgia state lawmaker, young black female being arrested for having the audacity to do her job, knocking on a door at the state capitol. I'm Rashad Ritchie, welcome to the conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the TV exclusive talking to state representative Park Cannon and her attorney, Gerald Griggs. Welcome to both of you, thank you for being on the conversation. Thank you for having us. Good evening. Well, let me first start by saying this, everybody was shocked when they saw what happened while you were knocking on this door representative. So what I wanna do first, I would like you to give us kind of what was going on in your mind that day at the Capitol when this Senate bill was being signed in secret, Senate Bill 202, take us to that day. Senate Bill 202 has been moving through the legislative process for about two weeks. But things began to speed up as public pressure ensued for a period of 17 days. At least there were protests and uprisings at Liberty Plaza with grannies and their umbrellas, people from the Asian community with community snacks, with black voting groups who were sharing stories, and with legislators who were standing out in the middle of the rain early in the morning until late in the evening to do a call to action for the state of Georgia about Senate Bill 202. What we knew is that this bill just kept getting more pages added to it that did not actually address the concerns of disenfranchised voters, but instead stroked the egos and increased the conspiracies that are made into law. So on Thursday, make no mistake, legislators in both the House and Senate chambers had their time to dissent and vote against or for Senate Bill 202. But it broke down on party lines and the debate made it very clear that our narratives around Sunday voting, AKA souls to the polls and ballot box drop offs, AKA community voting centers were not going to be upheld in the law. Instead, they provided statistics to try to say that a raw number of African American voters was a low percentage of voters. But when we took that raw number and we showed what percentage it was, it showed that 37% of African American or black voters in Georgia used Sunday voting or souls to the polls. Mm. So the idea that our truths were in real time being replaced in law by lies, I knew. And many legislators knew that we could not sit idly by after it passed our chambers and went to the governor's desk for a private signing that completely interrupted and sidestepped the normal bill signing process. Which let me be clear, I have the pins to prove it. Every year that I have been a sitting state lawmaker, I have helped to sign bills into law and been handed those signing pens by this same governor himself. So on that day, all I could think about was increasing the narrative of Senate Bill 202's passage into law. Here's what I want to do. Uh, let me play the clip um, from that day, and uh, we'll get more into it. And Attorney Griggs, I'm going to bring you on 
uh, after this clip. Yeah, you said you gave her one more time, like you're gonna do something. And you're going to arrest an elected representative. This elected representative is the youngest elected representative in the state of Georgia. Uh, let me go to Attorney Griggs, and I want to be very sensitive to the fact that this is still an ongoing criminal case. She has been charged with two serious felonies. Now, there's something in the Georgia Constitution, Attorney Griggs, and I want you to talk about this that bars arresting a lawmaker during legislative session. Explain that caveat of the Constitution and did this cop violate this Constitution? Yes, well under the Georgia Constitution, elected officials like Representative Cannon are protected from arrest while the legislative session is in session. And so they can only be arrested for limited exceptions, one would be treason, two would be a breach of the peace, and three would be a felony. And as you just saw in that last clip, neither of those categories apply. Um, uh, Representative Cannon was merely knocking on the door with other constituents and a few other members of the House to gain entry to see the signing of the bill. As she said a few minutes ago, she's done this every single year that she's been an elected uh, member of the House of Representatives. So it was normal for her to do this, and she wanted that extra transparency that millions of voters would get an opportunity to witness what was happening. So she knocked on the door, as you could see, she wasn't trying to interrupt anything other than being present. And it's also clear to see from the picture that was released from the governor's office that there were other members of the House of Representatives that were actually in the meeting. The question that bears to be asked is, why did the governor limit the ability of other members of the House to be present to witness the signing of this bill? This bill is very consequential to the voting rights of millions of Georgians. And that's simply all my client wanted to do was witness the signing of the bill. This is quite amazing because basically you have an elected representative. She's at her place of employment, virtually at her place of employment. And she's knocking on a door, she's doing it with respect. She's not kicking the door, she's not trying to open the door. She's literally just knocking on a door. I don't know where knocking on a door constitutes a breach of peace, a felony act or an act of treason. But I want to read something. Because this was really interesting and this was linked to the AJC earlier today. The officer who made this arrest is a lieutenant, a lieutenant. His name is G.D. Langford. G.D. Langford produced a 13 page report. Now, everyone who's watching this, you already know cops don't typically write 13 pages of anything, okay? This is a 13 page report and in this incident report, he says that he was worried about other protesters are being emboldened. And then he says, and I quote, the events of January 6, 2021. This is in the report. The events of January 6, 2021 at the US Capitol were in the back of my mind. This guy literally blamed Trump supporters for arresting a peaceful lawmaker at her place of employment. He goes on to talk about his thoughts and feelings in this report. Reports are supposed to be statements of fact. He veers severely away from that. He says, and I quote, I believed Cannon's actions of obstructing law enforcement in front of agitated protesters to constitute a breach of the peace. She's been charged with two felonies. Um, What's problematic about this incident report, Attorney Griggs? It's a lot of things that are problematic. One is that it does not wit- uh, it does not talk about the other witnesses that were present, the individuals that were live streaming, the fact that all of this is caught on video, and that the fact that there was no imminent breach of the peace. Mm-hmm. I understand what might have been in his mind, and that's for 
to be in his mind. But you know, the elements of a crime have to be met. And there are not the elements of any breach of the peace met. They're definitely not the elements of disruption of the General Assembly because she's clearly a member of the General Assembly. There are clearly other members of the General Assembly who are present at this bill signing. So there are serious issues. And again, Representative Cannon does not have to prove any of this. It's up to the police and the prosecutor to prove every essential element of the crimes charged. So we have serious issues with the mischaracterization of the facts, the lack of the witness support, the lack of video evidence support, all of these allegations. And so we would just humbly submit that there are factual inaccuracies in the report that need to be addressed. And that's why we will address that with the district attorney or we will address that with a jury. But the issue is clear, there are witnesses, there's live stream footage of every single thing that happened. Attorney well, Grace, can you explain the exact nature of these two felonies? What are they and what kind of time she would be facing if convicted? Yes, well, she's facing one charge of disrupting a public, of disrupting the General Assembly, and she's also charged with felony obstruction. One is a one to five year prison sentence on the felony obstruction, and the disruption of the General Assembly is one to three. So she faces a total of potentially eight years in prison, and that's why it's so important. That your viewers and everyone else understand that simply knocking on a door should not result in lengthy prison sentences. What should actually happen here is the protection of our democracy, the increasing of our voting rights, which is exactly what Representative Cannon was trying to do. She's trying to have transparency in the process to make sure people saw what was actually happening. And she also wanted to protect our voting rights. She stood in the shoes of so many great freedom fighters of the past that were simply fighting to make sure we protected our voting rights. It's, it's curious and interesting to think, not more than 14 or 15 feet away from that very spot, our late senator, I mean, our late representative John Lewis lied in state in the rotunda, mm. and he always gave us the charge to make sure that we get in the way. Make sure that we get in some good trouble. You call out something that's wrong. And that's exactly what Representative Cannon did in this instance. And that's why it's important that we stand with her, that we defend her, and that we make sure that we protect our voting rights here in Georgia. Representative Cannon, you have a lot of support, not only in the state of Georgia, but across the country and outside of the country. But you were placed under arrest. You then had to go into an elevator privately with these officers. They stuffed you inside of a police car. You had to take a mug shot, you had to go to jail. I want to know what were your feelings going through that process, knowing that you had done nothing unlawful whatsoever? What happened to me was definitely unlawful. The behavior of the officers is nothing short of nefarious, mm. but it pales in comparison significantly. When you look at the governor taking an opportunity for privacy while taking away the rights of Georgians to vote, and at least 2.5 million black Georgians were on my mind. At the time that I was detained, a law created to suppress the voting power of black people. We must not lose sight of this issue and we must not stop in the fight. As we just recalled, because I was just a few feet from where our late Congressman John Lewis lied in state, had walked with me and talked with me about his experiences. We must turn up for voting rights. We have to increase our ability to articulate and to be clear that right now, remedy looks like federal, meaning congressional acts that keep our voting rights intact. Let me highlight something quite ironic. The governor of Georgia literally said multiple times that no voter fraud took place in the state of Georgia. The chief elections officer, the secretary of state, 
Brad Raffensperger said in a recorded conversation, there was no voter fraud in the state of Georgia. However, they have literally legislated as if there was voter fraud in the state of Georgia. They are legislating on lies. Some of the elements of this bill, um, such as restricting early voting, uh, restricting what counties can do to accommodate their population uh, for voting, um, making sure that the Republican led legislature can actually take over any county in Georgia, any board of elections, anytime they choose. Let's unpack what's in Senate Bill 202. Also, making it a crime, an actual criminal offense to give someone water or a snack while they're waiting in lines in a state that has a history of long lines in non-white precincts. Let's unpack some of this bill. And Park Cannon, I go to you for that. What's in this bill? As the Secretary of the Georgia House Democratic Caucus, I have taken it very seriously to not only read every version of Senate Bill 202, but to disseminate talking points and helpful information so that our members can communicate that to their counties and to their communities. Over the past two weeks, we saw the process speed up right in front of our eyes and then behind closed doors. There would be a hearing that would happen and all of a sudden there would be new amendments. But when we voted on the bill on the floor, Yet and still, the bill was not online for public view. Wow. Only version of the bill that remained online through the House's deliberation was a two page bill. But as many of us know, when it passed the House, and yes, it was amended on the floor of the House to actually address issues related to what happens if a county doesn't have a website, what will they do to get that information out? That bill was then 98.5 pages long. You're telling us that 96 and a half pages worth of legislation that do three things majorly with no fiscal note. One, call for a state takeover by elected officials of those who have been appointed by their local communities. Meaning that they can actually empower the Secretary of State to remove an entire group of election officials and replace it with one appointee. Two, it limits Sunday voting as we know it, souls to the polls in the versions of taking away how many times a county can choose to use Sunday voting, but also saying you gotta choose between Saturday and Sunday. So if you choose to do Saturday voting, you're unable to do Sunday voting. I quickly want to unpack why it is so important that we protect the right to vote right up until election day. The scenario is this, you work all week until Friday. And you've been busy with your kids and your family and your commitment. You hear on the radio, election day is on Tuesday, make sure you get your vote in. If you don't have Saturday voting, if you don't have Sunday voting, the next day that you can vote is Tuesday. Mm. But you're back at work, so you are unable to cast your ballot. The third thing that this bill does is it takes away ballot drop boxes which have been so incredibly helpful during our global pandemic. There are federal guidelines that were released after the September 11th attack on the United States that outlined how to provide elections in stages of emergency or pandemic. And we were following these new guidelines to say, we can do different ways of ballot collection as long as there is a camera and that is in a secure location. So Senate Bill 202 should never have been signed into law without a fiscal note because of those three impacts on Georgia voters.
I spoke to a commissioner earlier today in another county outside of Fulton County, and he made the very same proclamation that you're making. He said, we're going to have to pay for this law, and we have no idea how much we're going to pay because there is no fiscal note whatsoever. Let me read something that you tweeted, Representative, after you were released on bond. Reverend Senator Raphael Warnock was there supporting you and many others. And you tweeted, and I quote, we will not live in fear, we will not be controlled. We have a right to our future and a right to our freedom. We have one minute left, I want you to tell those who are watching this, what do you think they should do to secure democracy? Because what happens in Georgia is just a microcosm of what's happening across the country. To secure our democracy, continue to raise your voice and to raise your opinions about the voting legislation that is being passed across America. Because the federal government will need to address it with one opportunity, which is known as the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. We are so thrilled that so many families and communities are standing with us here in Georgia. And we say to you, keep knocking America. Very well said, Representative Park Cannon, Attorney Gerald Griggs. I appreciate you both for blazing the trail, being progressive and being thoughtful about democracy. Thank you for joining us on the conversation. Thank you for having us.